See, with I annotate, I can and, and I can Joe's set up an outline on real that nice side and pick out the thing that's coming up. Enthusiastic. I'll look into that. Just and to make sure. I think pretty talented and intelligent oh, guy that's taking over. Like he's like, what is he, 32 or something? Yeah, so, I, I mean, Joe... Well, almost. Yeah, it was a little right, late. Hi, Shelly. All right. It is 6.30, and so we're going to continue with the public portion of the meeting. During the closed session, information was provided to the board. No action was taken. We will now start the, the meeting with the roll call showing that uh, Director Jaffe is not here tonight but the rest of us are. There's no public hearing tonight, so the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to take something off? I'd yes, like sir. to mention one thing. Yeah. The documents that we were provided was tonight, and we put them on the back table at the same time. Yes, and they're, they've been provided online as well at the same time we got them. Um, anyway, and then, um, so consent agenda, any items anyone wishes to take off of consent? Not up here. Is anyone from the public? Okay, I'll accept. I'll that. move the consent agenda. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now we'll move on to oral communications. So this would be on items not on the agenda. So anyone wish to speak during this time? Thank you, Becky Steinbruner, resident of Aptas. I would like to make a general comment. Um, because I am gathering materials from the past for the administrative record of um, case 19CV00181 against the district, it is interesting to me to see that uh, in not too long ago, the district uh, kept much more complete minutes um, it noted the name of the members of the audience that spoke. It gave a brief description of what they said. And in the minutes, it appears that there was allowed uh, discourse between members of the public and presenters of major topics of information. Now, granted, the material I'm looking at was regarding the uh, uh, pre Pure Water SoCal project and its predecessor name, but um, big projects, big um, important information presentations were allowed to have the members of the public ask questions and they were answered. And that question answer is noted in your minutes. A couple of years ago that all changed. And so now there is very little information as to what um, people said there's no mention of their names. There's no mention of what they said or the topic even. Your meetings have been uh, video recorded before that change in time. So while I understand that one might say, well, it's all on video, I can also tell you that some of your videos are not from community television. And I've told you this because um, there was an anomaly but there are some of them that are not from community television, and I've asked community television about this, and they say it's out of their hands. So I want to present this information to you because you are getting a transparency award tonight. And of course, one always wants to do better. So I'm asking you to return to your former level of reporting of public input and allow, once again, um, question and answer discourse between um, the presenter and the members of the public as long as they were respectful and as long as they are timely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, any board communications? I went to the aqua committees today and I still have the documents I haven't looked at, but I'll, I'll talk about that at the next meeting. I went to okay. Groundwater Committee, the Water Management Committee, and the Water Quality Committee. Great. Thank you for doing that. Anyone else? I, I guess I do. Yeah. Um, I had a very nice experience because I had a leak and I got one of those leak notices. 
and um, of course my mind's gone blank. What is his name? Roy Sykes. Roy Sykes came over and he checked my meter, showed me how to read it, and then um, showed me that the problem was my toilets were they were cycling, so I didn't realize they were leaking because they were doing it off and on throughout the day and had to put the flapper in and he got flappers. One of them didn't work very well, so I bought another one that was specifically for my toilet and because of his training, I did it right and now I don't have any leaks. So. Great, uh, he's yeah. a good man. It was a really nice Roy's experience. Roy's done some good work out there. Yeah. yeah, that's that free service that we provide to all our customers and we joke in the office that Roy is the most well-liked person in our district because he shows <laughs> up with rebates and sharing knowledge and that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank problems. you for that compliment, Tony. Yeah, but he's, a, he, he's does his job well. Yeah, we, we've got a lot of good people in the district. So. All right, um, then that being said, there's no reports, so we'll go to the first item of administrative business, which is um, item 6.1, conditional will serves. There's just one, let's get this up. This yep, just one ADU. Turn on. Seems to be the upcoming theme. <laughs> Um, I have no real comments. There's no unique situation here, so if you have any questions, I'd be ha happy to answer them. Otherwise, okay. it's all yours. Anyone? Questions? Any questions from the public on this one? Seeing none? Any comment from the public? Seeing none. Um, any motions? I'll move to approve. Okay. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. All right, next item is item 6.2. Hi, good evening. I'm going to be presenting this item, and first I just wanted to do a little bit of introduction, and then we do have a special guest here. Um, Soquel Creek Water District is one of approximately 2,300 special districts in California. The Special District Leadership Foundation was formed in 1999, and it's a 5013C organization that was formed to provide recognition and certification opportunities to special district officials and employees to enhance the service of the public. It is dedicated to excellence in local government. This agency has designed and implemented many programs and today we're very proud to be recognized for two such programs under their umbrella, the District's Transparency Certificate of Excellence as well as the Special District Administrator's Certification. Tonight um, we have Steven Nascimento who will be uh, presenting the awards and I'd just like to say thank you for coming. And I'm, I'm just going to do a quick shout out since I've been involved with special dis districts for over 20 years here and at the uh, Santa Cruz Port District and uh, the California Special Districts Association. You, you see a lot of organizations and, and uh, this one's at the top of its game. They're a really well run organization and they provide a tremendous um, uh, value to the to the members and you go to their conferences and they and I've told Neil this many times he's nailed it you know they've got he's their executive director they know how to make them informative and uh, just really beneficial so to that you can take that back I, that are a genuine thanks for what you guys do thank you I came here to say nice things about you guys and now we're getting <laughs> the praise so thank you very much uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening uh, this is my first time presenting two certificates to a district in one evening so uh, a special appreciation for you and your efforts um, I wanted to start with talking about the district transparency certificate of excellence and a little bit about the special district leadership foundation for those in the audience the special district leadership foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to promoting excellence in special districts through our recognition programs and one of those recognition programs is the District Transparency Certificate of Excellence. Um, this program was created in 2013 as an effort to promote transparency in the operations and governance of special districts and to provide special districts with an opportunity to showcase their efforts in transparency. Um, there's really three main uh, components or requirements of the program. One is uh, additional transparency requirements, which include current ethics training certificates for all board members, so you all have a role in uh, receiving the certificate. Uh, timely filing of the state controller special district financial transactions and compensation report. There's also website requirements, which include posting the board meeting schedule, district mission statement, 
uh, current audit and budget and the board of directors uh, roster with terms of office and on the district's website. Uh, there's also additional outreach requirements, community outreach requirements. The district um, has to select two community outreach efforts, which uh, they get to choose from a regular newsletter, uh, an annual informational public budget meeting, uh, or a community transparency review. And so by undertaking all these efforts, um, your district has shown that you have a commitment to transparency and CSDA wants to recognize uh, that, that effort. Uh, and so tonight, and as I understand, you first received the certificate back in 2015, uh, which I think is worth mentioning because one of the things that SCLF requires is that you have to maintain these initiatives and every two years it gets renewed and that you've renewed it in 17 and now again uh, tonight. And so I want to recognize you for that and was hoping that we could uh, maybe get a photo of everyone together getting their certificate and just would like the audience to join me in a round of applause for their efforts in transparency. I'd, I'd like to have Emma and Melanie, since Emma, Emma did the last, this most current one in the board, of course, uh, and Melanie started the first one, maybe a shot of y'all. That yeah, that'd be right? great. Up in front. <laughs> I know. And, you know, really, all the managers, if you want to get in the shot, I think I think all, all I think all the sure. managers. All the Thank managers. you. Come on up here, please. Christine, you got some time. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, that's great. CSC always likes to promote our districts who, um, on our Facebook page and through other means, who uh, receive this certificate. Um, I also have the privilege tonight of recognizing your general manager, Ron Duncan. Um, CSDA, one of its uh, most highly regarded uh, programs is our special, special district administrators uh, certification. Uh, this is a certification is a volunteer, a voluntary designation sought by individuals who strive to be the best in their field. And this certification requires a two hour exam covering various aspects of special district administration and gives successful candidates recognition unmatched by any other program. Um, as Ron can attest, it's not just the, uh, it's not just the exam, it's all the hours that go into preparing for the exam. Um, there's uh, many hours of continued education that are required and it's a very thorough uh, process. Um, there are, I think are less than 50 special district uh, administrators who are certified within the state of California. So it really is uh, quite the effort uh, and is a really uh, noble recognition. And so with that, I want to, on behalf of the board and staff of the Special District Leadership Foundation, it's my pleasure to present Ron Duncan of the Sokol Creek Water District as a certified special district administrator in recognition of successful completion of the exam, a high level of knowledge and expertise in the areas of special district management and governance, and a strong commitment to the community. So congratulations, Ron. Thank you, and I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll come up, I, I just say that, you know, some people look at um, criticism or input, you know, when I get the, my 360 degree evaluations every year, uh, a couple years ago, that was the input that I got from, I think the board and the staff was, you're, you're good in these areas, but beef up in the kind of the administrative, legal, Brown Act, all that. So I took that to heart and uh, I did. I studied for about a year for the, the exam. I didn't think I passed, but anyway. <laughs> uh, good job. Um. 
And I will just say that, you know, Ron's not only put his brains and his hard work into that, but he puts, puts his heart into this as well. This means a lot to him to have the district not only be valuable to the community, but also that all the employees are treated well and are listened to. So kudos, Ron. Thank you. I appreciate it. An honor. And I think that means a lot to the board and to the staff. Absolutely. Passion he puts into it. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. And um, next is um, item 6.3. This is. Okay. I mean, if any, is there any public comment on the awards? Okay. So, um, item 6.3 contract award with Professional Meters Incorporated. Yep, that'll be me. Yep. <laughs> So in support of our uh, upgrade from drive-by automated meter reading to advanced metering infrastructure, we um, developed a request for proposals for a contractor to replace about 15,500 uh, registers and, and exchange those out. And the RFP um, was developed because metering system upgrades really affect every department at the district. It was developed with input from engineering and operations and maintenance and customer service and finance. So um, I think we, we had a good RFP out there um, that was released in March and we got back, uh, by April 17th, we got back five bids, which um, I thought was a, a good showing um, given the specific nature of, of the work and the proposal. So um, the bids are laid out, the summary of the bids in um, the table in the memo. And to give contractors flexibility, we uh, established a minimum bid of 600 exchanges per month. And then we allowed contractors to provide an optional bid up to <coughs> 1,200 a month. We wanted to see if there was any price break by you know, allowing people to do that, given that most of the people that do this kind of work are not located in our area. They're, they travel all over the country and they do electrical and, and water system upgrades. So um, as you can see in the proposals, the cost at 1,200 exchanges per month did come out uh, lower. Um, the lowest bid was from uh, Ferguson Waterworks and the second lowest bid was from Professional Meters Incorporated. There's about a $70,000 difference there. Um, however, we felt that the bid from Professional Meters Incorporated uh, had a lot more uh, detail and they have a very robust electronic work order system that allows for um, electronic upload into our billing system for all of the data collected during the exchanges and it really reduces the chance of error from manual transcription. Um, it provides for detailed reporting and project management which um, was very valuable and so we feel that uh, really going with professional meters is, is a best option that they provided the best, most responsive proposal. Just um, while, you're, while you're mentioning that, I, I think you said also the other one wasn't, was not gonna maybe do all the meters. Because yeah, they the set so a lot of restrictions on uh, basically prepping, uh, <coughs> clearing the areas of meter boxes with shrubbery and also a five minute limit on digging out meter boxes. And you could clean out a meter box one day and another go back a week <coughs> later and it could be filled up again. So we know that we, most of our meter boxes probably have some debris that has to be removed and so, that would result in a lot of those being passed on to our staff who are gonna be doing other things in support of the project. So um, we feel that PMI is really the best contractor out there for this work and at the best price um, for what the services are asking for. We did check their references. Um, they did Coastside County Water District's AMI upgrade, which was meters and registers. They did City of Ventura and City of Pleasanton, and all three of those agencies had exceptional things to say about them, especially this electronic work order system that really made the projects flow and go well. So with that in mind, we're seeking board approval tonight to move ahead. Uh, approve resolution 1909, awarding the contract to PMI at a rate of 1200 per month and to authorize the general manager to sign an agreement with them and a purchase order. Okay, questions from the board? I, well, I can only say that I agree with, I agree with your assessment. Um, what they said, I thought it was pretty critical to, to meet 
as inclusive as, as possible so that the project will actually get done yeah. on time. Yes. Yeah, and at 1200 per month, uh, assuming we start in June, which is what we're, we're planning, if, if this is approved, it'll be a 13-month project. So that'll be somewhere you know, around July or August of, of next year. And, and when, w when would the act, I know this isn't related to this, but just when will the interface for the public be available? The interface for the public will be available. We're, what we're also working on in parallel to the contractor, the first steps are to get the first um, base station and repeater in and test that technology and work out all the any kinks that might come up and um, also develop uh, new processes internally in terms of checking for leaks and high usage and, and working with our office and making sure that we're providing our customers great service and then secondly we'll be working on uh, incorporating the customer portal so that probably won't happen until a little bit later in 2019 but in the interim staff will be checking every day leak alerts and, and high usage alerts and we'll then following to, up with so customers. We'll start to save water right away as they yeah, go in. Yeah, okay, exactly. Good. Great. Um, any comments from the public on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have yet to see any um, discussion of the opt-out um, availability for your customers. That is an important issue for many people, and I would like to hear some discussion about that issue and how um, this new meter replacement and smart meter replacement will work um, and accommodate those who wish to opt out. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, any motion? I will make the first two motions. Do, one and do two. you want Shelley to address You want, to, want sure, me to comment I mean, on the opt-out? Opt so we yeah. already have an opt-out program in place for our AMR drive-by system. And right now it's a $10 per month manual read and that's assessed on a customer's bill. And we're planning on just continuing that same policy until we get our AMI system in and we can reevaluate whether we need to increase that cost of service okay. fee. So. Opt-out policy has been in place for a while and will continue okay. to be. Okay. So, any I motion? Made, I made the first two motions. First two motions. I'll second them. Seconded by Director Lather. Um, roll call, please. Director Lather. Yes. Vice President Daniels. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Lehu. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so we will go to item 6.4, election of special district alternate member. Yeah, I was looking at Emma because she actually wrote this memo, and I think it's the first one that you've actually lent your name to, even though you ghostwritten. You want to switch over or, or go I'm, down no, to the sorry. signature page? So thank you, Emma. Uh, so congratulations to Director Lather. She was nominated by our board and elected by her colleagues out there in special district land uh, to LAFCO. So, um, and uh, Dr. LeHue is uh, stepping down from the position and representing, so thank you for doing that. Okay. So what's in, what, what in that transaction, I guess, uh, it opened up uh, Director Lather's uh, alternate position, and so we didn't know if the board wanted to nominate uh, a board member for that position or somebody else even out in uh, another board member uh, in a spe for another special district. And if you do, uh, you, know, you can see the motions there. Uh, regarding how you want to conduct the election and then give give us permission to submit the nomination. Okay. Anybody have any ideas, thoughts? Something you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> no. You want to do it? I don't have any. Um, no, I actually don't even know what the time commitment is. <laughs> yeah, it's um, meetings are essentially once a month. On, on Wednesday. Wednesdays at 10 a.m. And as an alternate, you wouldn't have to go to all of them. Yeah, that's what it is. Convenient. I know you were kind of interested in the past. Yeah. And this I, know, I just got through idea. an election, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, this is just being elected by the um, boards of all the other special districts. So. Well, I'll think about it then. Okay. We won't make any nominations at this time. Okay. Okay. Right. So then we don't really need to worry about the preference for conducting the election then. 
correct? Right, right. right. Uh, and I don't know if the due dates could have passed by the next board meeting. It, the, yeah. The deadline is June no, 7th. So June 7th. So you okay. could still okay. so we have think one about more. it. We have one more. Okay, board. we'll bring it back to the next meeting if that's me talk to me about it. Let's put that on the agenda. For sure. Okay. Then we'll move on to item 6.5. Consider. Uh, so who's taking that one? Yeah, I'll kick that off. Um, this is for consideration of agreement for an option to purchase uh, the property at 2505 uh, Shanna Clara Avenue uh, and the corner of um, Soquel Avenue. And, and so what's on the back table is what was provided just before we went into closed session so it's accessible to everybody all at the same time is the uh, purchase option I mean the uh, purchase option agreement and then also if we were to move forward with that or the board was desired to move forward with that in the future we'd have to come back to another meeting the purchase agreement and we know people are interested in this so we actually put together a few slides um, I think there are a few new faces here in the audience are probably here for this this item is that correct look at you okay anybody else okay great so uh, let us let us run through this, if you would, and uh, then we can uh, take uh, comment and that sort of thing. So let's switch it over here, shall we? And then, Melanie, if you could run that. So go up to Y and Y. So back up the other way. So one more up. Two Ys. You know, why do we need a project? We, we always, the Y is at the central of any decision, you know, if you really peel back the onion. So why do we need a project? We're going to touch on that. And then why the purification portion at Chanticleer? So we think that's just trying to dive right into what we think the new members of the audience want to uh, discuss. So why the challenge? What is our challenge? Next slide. Uh, it's seawater intrusion. Uh, this is a map of Soquel Creek Water District. The bay is in dark blue, and then our, our service area is outlined in uh, black there. What you see, red dots and orange dots, are our monitoring wells along the coast that show uh, seawater intrusion on shore. The red dots are nearly at sea water concentrations, and the yellow dots are, are very high, too. The limit's around 250. So I think the orange dots is at least 1,000 to 10,000, if I see that right. So we have it on shore, and the green dots are our wells, water uh, monitoring wells. And the wells with the W are our pumping wells. That's what we supply all our water to all our customers. And there are a lot of other wells in here, too. We pump probably about 60% of the water out of the basin. So preventing what what we didn't know a couple years ago was we knew we had seawater intrusion on either end of the district matter of fact just about six months a year ago a guy in the southern end walked in and his farm just got hit by seawater intrusion he had to give back about twenty five thousand dollars because the farmer couldn't use his land anymore because his well went bad so we knew where we had seawater intrusion on either side we didn't know where it was in let's say the middle of the banana kind of like capitola and all that area where you don't see red dots that area right there thank you so next slide so this is a bigger area this the, the area down in yellow is monterey salinas that's where seawater intrusion has occurred over uh the years into there so it's about eight miles inland or 10 miles inland it's actually moved quite rapidly in the last couple of years uh further and then that's the pajaro valley it's in about three miles there and the way I, I, I think about this is it may only be moving, it, how it moves is, is based on the gradient, the hydraulic gradient. But in Pajaro, it was moving about three quarters of a foot a year. So if you can imagine a cliff eroding three, you know, an ocean cliff eroding three quarters of a foot every year, what that would feel like. Well, that's what it's like uh, with seawater intrusion, except it's underground. And because it's underground, it happens and it's, it's hard to stop. People don't believe it. Uh, it's easy as an elected official to say, I'll kick the can. I think our board's taken a different position. We have a slide that's not in here, uh, but I often use the statistic to, to stress the point, is that it's uh, groundwater, sea, seawater intrusion is happening about 70% of the populated coastal regions of the world that rely on groundwater. So we have a map that actually shows around the world and you can see all the spots. So this is not a figment of our imagination. 
This is a very, very real thing. Um, I showed this map uh, or last week. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Let's go to the next slide. Wait a minute, before you do. Yeah. It's not three quarters of a foot per, y per year. Oh, did I say year? No, you said a year. Oh, I'm sorry, day. Yeah, well, a day. day. Yeah, per day. And the Pajaro, it was found in 1950, yeah. and now it's over a mile inland. So that's, three like miles a, inland. that's like 100 feet per year. Yeah, it's three miles inland. So if you do the math, 1950 and 5,280 feet per mile, blah, blah, blah. So, it's, so our basin, uh, the state recognized the threat to our basin uh, and declared it critically overdrafted uh, just a few years ago. They just last month came out with that redesignation and published that, and we're still classified as critically overdrafted. And that's that area. There's only about four or five coastal areas that are, are designated as critically overdrafted. In the state as a whole, there's only 21 basins out of 500 that are critically overdrafted. And so what that means is the state has mandated that the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency finish a plan in about, by January, with projects to bring the basin back in sustainability and it has to be done by 2040. So 20 years, we've got to bring this basin that's been out, out, of, out of whack since the 1980s. Next slide, please. So remember I said in the banana, <coughs> bent portion there, you know, let's call it Capitola, if you will, Sea Cliff. We didn't know where seawater intrusion uh, was offshore because this is, if imagine layered aquifers and if the ocean's here and this is land, the seawater, as you pump on land, it comes in like this under the aquifers and destroys them. That's what it does. It, it, it comes in and contaminates the water with seawater, which makes it unusable. Well, we didn't know. We thought maybe it's a mile offshore and we have a lot of time. Uh, it could be very close to shore. Well, the Danish government offered us this technology and they worked uh, under the review of the U.S. Geological Survey and Stanford University, and they're both writing papers. Stanford's paper just came out, matter of fact, with this, what we're showing you here right now. It's online, it's free. Uh, and it was wonderful because nobody thought it could work, but it did so that's the positive part the negative the the downside or the the was the result and what they discovered is that it's right at the shoreline it's not a mile off so it's right near the wells and stanford has even come out with a paper that confirmed that and they said it may even be a little closer than you think we think there's some beyond where you flew so it's it's at the coastline so it's 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 there it's real now we presented this the other night and somebody said this feels like a scare tactic it feels like a threat um, you know, I didn't know how to respond because it's data. And then I thought about it. Yeah, it probably does because it is scary, because it has happened. Of course, there's a visceral reaction to, to seeing this and going, uh, it's not, you know, trying to defend against it. But as you can see down to our friends to the south, and I don't have the map for all around the world, but they may have had the same reaction that it couldn't happen there, but it, but it does. And it happens, and it, and it continues to happen until you stop it. So Once Kate, it happens, it's ruined for pretty much forever. Yeah, I mean, there, there, you can, in a, in a near zone, you can probably flush some of it out and bring some of it back. And those concentrations that you see there were taken in 2017. You can see 1,000 on the left, up to 1,700. And remember, the limit's 250 at the red dots 17, there. 17,000. Yeah. So, well, one thing we did get some feedback on the map that Ron first showed, which just showed SoCal Creek Water District wells. So on this map, it does now show other municipal wells that are also pumping within the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin. So there are wells, not just SoCal Creek Water District, but also Central Water District, which serves Aptos, and then the Live Oak Well Field, which is part of the City of Santa Cruz Water Department system. Yeah. And we'll get to that. Live Oak... Uh, has a well filled, I mean, probably before most of y'all's time, but they had their own little groundwater, and we'll, 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 we got a slide on that, so we'll get to it in a second. So the next slide, please. Well, what we didn't add, and maybe we will in another rendition, are the thousands of private yeah. well owners yeah. um, that also are pumping. Yeah, that are threatened by this. So the concept of in this together is the communities that haven't worked together have had seawater intrusion. This is uh, you know, well, the city pumps water out of the live oak wells. 
uh, we pump water, private well pump pumpers, Cabrillo College, golf course, all the way down to Pajaro, mutuals. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of time if we don't stop it, as you can have seen on some of the other maps. So that what we've come to embrace is we have to work together. So that's the message there. Now, are you going to take this? Okay, so Melanie's going to take the next part, and then I'll come in and, and, and wrap it up at the end. I just have a few slides just to introduce for those of people in the audience who may not exactly know what the Pure Water SoCal project is. There are also some handouts on the back table that provide um, fact sheets or overviews related to the project. So here's one here. The Pure Water SoCal project is actually one of the water supply options within the SoCal Creek Water District's community water plan. The community water plan um, was an effort by SoCal Creek Water District to really get input from our community on what they valued in terms of water su sustainability and reliability. And from those efforts, the district has been pursuing water conservation, groundwater management, and um, developing new water supplies. Through that effort, SoCal Creek Water District um, is the lead agency working with multiple other agencies, including the City of Santa Cruz, the County of Santa Cruz, and the City of Capitola, on providing a reliable water supply by using purified recycled water and, and what is pure water SoCal. So the project entails capturing about 25% of the 8 million gallons a day that goes out to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. About 50% of that 8 million gallons a day is generated um, in the unincorporated areas of the county um, that we serve. So that's Aptos, uh, Seascape, Capitola, SoCal, that region. Then another 4 million gallons a day is produced in the city of Santa Cruz. That water is treated to secondary standards, and then it goes out into the ocean. What Pure Water SoCal is planning to do is to recapture that water, recycle it, and then purify that water through advanced treatment processes so that water can be put to beneficial reuse to create a seawater intrusion barrier to prevent that seawater intrusion that Ron talked about that's actively intruding into our groundwater resources and keep it at bay. So one way to address overdraft conditions is to refill the basin, create that um, higher pressure head that would then keep that salt water from moving inland. And actually, the source water would be tertiary. Right. We'll get yes. Perf thank you for the lead in. So as part of the project uh, development and evolution, we have completed a feasibility study. We completed the environmental review process. And we've been working with the agencies on um, furthering the preliminary design. And as uh, Director Daniels mentioned, what the project now entails is that the water would be first treated at tertiary level. So the advanced water purification process includes microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and then hitting it with UV light. The first portion, which is the microfiltration, actually takes secondary water and creates it to tertiary level. Tertiary level treatment is what people may know as recycled water, purple pipe water. It's traditionally used for irrigation of parks, golf courses, crops. That water um, is then going to be um, treated to tertiary levels down at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is that star at the bottom. It would um, be uh, serve uh, multiple purposes. First, it would provide feed water to the Advanced Water Purification Facility at Chanticleer. But it also would be used for the city of Santa Cruz to use recycled water at their facility for in-plant uses. They're also planning on using it to irrigate a park nearby. And they're also going to be creating a fill station. So typically right now, when there's contractors or, or development that's going on and they have to fill up at a bulk water station for dust control or construction, there will be a fill station now so that the water that they're using is not going to be drinking water. It's going to be recycled water. So the water then at w is treated to tertiary levels down at the wastewater treatment facility, and it would be piped over to the Shanna Clear site where it would be purified. So I know we've been getting quite a few letters, um, and, and there is some still discussion, misinformation, that this project is a sewer project, a sewer treatment plant, a wastewater treatment plant. This is not 
So the water, feed water is recycled water, and the water, I don't even have the recycled, but this is secondary. Oh, okay. So uh, the recycled, the tertiary I think is in somebody's okay. car. But this is secondary water. So this is what goes out to the ocean every day. And it's pretty clean. I mean, um, we, we open it up, we have people smell it. Some people say it smells like pond water. Um, so the water then is, is treated through microfiltration, and then it would go to the, sh to the Santa, uh, Shanna Clear site. It would be uh, purified through reverse osmosis. Some people have reverse osmosis technology under their sink, um, or it's also the same technology if you go and you go get those big five-gallon things at a grocery store. Um, that's They use reverse osmosis technology. It's hit with some UV light and it becomes purified water. So this is purified water from Orange County Water District. They've generated over 200 billion gallons of water that goes and um, recharges and creates a seawater intrusion barrier down in Orange County. That purified water then would be transported through those blue lines on the map to three uh, sites that the district hydrologist has helped to identify that would be uh, beneficial to the Mid-County Groundwater Basin to create kind of what they call like an iron curtain or seawater intrusion barrier system to protect the groundwater wells behind it. Just one thing to note, um, you know, use of recycled water, especially advanced purified water, is something that is not uncommon in California or in other places. This is a map of water reuse in California and how it's being put to beneficial reuse by either uh, being placed into the groundwater basin uh, to replenish the groundwater basin or create a seawater intrusion barrier, or it's also plans used to um, augment surface water supplies. So just wanted to kind of note that in terms of the map and that the demand projections out there uh, statewide is to increase the use of recycled water to over 400 million gallons a day by 2023. Uh, currently, I just kind of wanted to also recognize that uh, two things. In at the end of December of 2018, the state passed some new policy in their recycled water policy goals. Again, that stated expansion of reuse. Um, there is no new water and also to really identify and set some priorities related to maximizing recycled water in areas where there's the groundwater resources are in a state of overdraft. Currently, there is a state bill called SB 322, which is co-sponsored by Senator Hertzberg and Senator Weiner, and um, that bill is to reduce ocean discharge of treated wastewater effluent and put it to beneficial reuse. And I, I think that's important in the current uh, bill version, if you don't do it, it's $2,000 an acre foot. So what that means, that and it, and it pushes it back to the water provider, so Santa Cruz and us would have to relay that cost on to our uh, customers if, it, if, if that bill succeeds in it's the way it's moving now. But you want to recycle. Can I just mention one other thing? Is just that um, a lot of energy and effort has been already been put into treating the water to secondary standards that's now just getting wasted and put out into the ocean. So um, the additional energy and technology to get it to usable for recycling and then polishing it for purification is not it is a very beneficial use. I yeah, uh, I mean, to put a number to it, each household in this area pays $750, although that's uh, per year, to have their uh, water treated and put out to the ocean. So we'd be capturing that. And that actually, that rate's going up, I believe. My last slide before I turn it back to Ron is just, again, kind of giving an, a visual of what uh, the inside of a water purification facility would look like. The units behind um, myself and Director Lather and um, a City of Santa Cruz staffer are the reverse osmosis membranes on a municipal level. Obviously, they're bigger than the kind that you would have underneath your sink. <clears throat> but again, just to, to clearly show that this is not uh, what some people may envision when they think of, of a the misinformation of a wastewater treatment plant that there would be these these open pits or, or something. Everything is enclosed. Uh, it's a closed system. There is no smell or odor. Everything is um, being treated through membranes. And that facility there um, was a demonstration facility in San Diego. It was about a one million gallon per day facility. So there's there's n not a lot a lot of units that some people may think of. 
um, it, it really is a nice, compact way to provide uh, a water treatment facility. Yeah, I think it's important to reiterate um, the water coming has, I mean, the water going out the ocean has no odor. It's treated again because odor is a big thing to people. So it's further treated. It absolutely has no odor. So really, I think the, the couple of you that are out there from uh, Live Oak, and I'm a Live Oak resident myself, are going, but why Shanna Claire? You know? So we did look at many, many, many sites. And this site was chosen to optimize uh, community benefit and as a whole. And, and let me get specific here. Next slide. So here's a slide out of uh, the urban water management plan from the city of Santa Cruz. What you see there on the tip is Pleasure Point. I think everybody knows that area. And you see what's called, you see some monitoring wells, but you also see the production wells in uh, uh, what they call the Belts Well Field. So Roland Drive, if anybody's ever been to Roland uh, Drive off 30th, down in there, there are a couple wells uh, in the ground. And the amount of water they've been pumping out of here, the city of Santa Cruz, and providing to Live Oak is enough to serve, I think it's either, I think it's half, about half of Live Oak. To put it in another perspective, it's about 500 acre feet, and put it another way, it's about one third of the, of the problem, the deficit that we're facing, or the, the amount of water that Pure Water Soquel would uh, produce. So, Live Oak is, is, you know, in the game here. And this is within, they have wells, and it's within the Mid-County Groundwater uh, Basin. Okay, next slide. So, this is complicated, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run you through it, if you can hang with me for a second. So, what we, this, is a, this is modeling, groundwater modeling done by a uh, hydrologist for the Mid-County Groundwater Agency. And you see the coastline there in the upper right. You see some wells circled uh, there in that picture, that uh, right along Pleasure Point. So those are the wells that are um, graphed here in these graphs. And let me explain the graphs. On the left side of the graph, you have uh, elevation, uh, groundwater elevation. And uh, on the right, on along the bottom is time going out many, many years. So they've worked a couple years on these groundwater models, and this is kind of state of the art. The dash line that you see there, either the fine dash line or the, um, uh, the more line? broken dash line, yeah, those are where we need to get the water levels to be in order to prevent seawater intrusion, okay? So we got to get above the, the, those dash lines, otherwise it's, it's continuing to come. And you can see it's down below that uh, now at, at, at some of these points because they, they have it in the real data point starting there. The yellow line is baseline what what happens if we don't do anything no action no action and you can see at those elevations that seawater is is coming at you plain and simple plain and simple you double that distance or drop that line twice it'll come at you twice as fast it's a linear equation so anyway what you see in the green and blue is what the impact of pure water soquel has when we recharge the wells and you can see it brings it up above there and brings it up maybe a little more than we need in the bottom right but not a, enough up in the top left so we're advancing this concept to uh, redistribute pumping a little bit more so in other words where we where we put water in recharge the wells which show them over here would be over here we could pull a little bit of that out, still create a seawater barrier, but pump less down in the wells that you see down in the Live Oak or um, other places that we have wells, the Jewel Box, uh, all the way down Aptos, whatnot, and more uniformly create a, uh, I like to call it a uh, seawater iron curtain. Um, so what I'm trying to demonstrate here is number one, Live Oak, I want to be very clear about this, Live Oak, because this is, this is something we missed early on when we talked to the school district and other people. They go, Live Oak, and we go, well, this, I'll get to some other reasons, but we, we, it was a, 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 men, a, me, a member of the public that brought this to us and said, well, well it's clearly helping. And so anyway, you get the idea, Live Oak pumps water, the, this, and they're creating a situation that's unsustainable. Um, and I should be clear, Santa Cruz pumps that water. The 500 acre feet a year they've been pumping, again, that's one third of the problem. They're really allowed 
their urban water management plan had estimated they, they would be pumping in the future three times that much. Now, I don't know if they will, but that would be equal to what the project produces, okay? I hope I'm not talking too many numbers. Let's get to some pictures. So here we are, Highway 1. Uh, on the left is the uh, Santa Clara site. And then on the right is the Kaiser site. So uh, and the sheriff's, in the sheriff's office. office right there. So just to give you like a scale, um, I think our site's maybe three quarters or half the size of the Kaiser site. Um, and let's go down to the next slide. So this is what was in the draft EIR. It's a very rudimentary picture, but I just wanted you to see. You can see Soquel Avenue and then Chanticleer there. And then uh, what's important to note here is the proposed bike path pedestrian way. I don't know if, if any uh, people in the crowd are aware of that. Uh, we weren't, but it's been a 10 years in the making. Um, uh, EIR is approved. Well, we were aware of that. Why? Well, we were aware, but I wasn't aware oh. like three years ago, and it's been 10 years oh, in the right. making. Yeah, we've been, we've been recently aware. Uh, 10 years in the making and um, a completed EIR, right? Mm -hmm. EIR certified. EI certified. And they're at 60%. And they're at 60% design on that. So that was one of the things that attracted us to this, this site because that bike path, as you'll see, obliterates the frontage along SoCal and, and for store frontage and that sort of thing it pretty much is a, a no-go people aren't interested in when you when your when your road frontage is gone so um, it made the site less valuable next. to something like that next slide please so here is a picture of the site yeah, everybody recognizes it by the old house that's that's there um, it's a barn I think. yeah barn whatever it actually was a house so uh, there's the glass place, and it gives you a little little side. It's it's uh, there's the APN. It's zone light industrial. So they're the the it, the uh, approved uses. Approved uses, yeah. Next slide, please. So here's an artist rendition, and this really doesn't mean a whole lot because we're seeking, as you'll see at the end, input from the community about design features and that sort of thing from the Live Oak community specifically uh, about what they want to see. Uh, as far as uh, the layout and the facility. So here it is. Is this out of the EIR? This is out of the Regional Transportation okay, Commission. Okay, so this is the RTC who, who we've been working with, and they're very excited to have a willing partner to say you can take that uh, you know, portion of our site so you can put the bike uh, pedestrian pathway. So this is coming over Highway 1 from the left, coming down and coming right down all along the front of that lot, uh, Shanna Clara lot. Okay, next slide, please. Here's a view if you're coming down Highway 1. I just, these are cool. I just wanted to throw you in there, throw them in there just so you can see what's coming down the pipe here for us, which I'm really excited. I'm a big biker, and, and to have a, a, a way over that is, is critical because we know Soquel and, and 41st are pretty dangerous. dangerous. So, next one. So, um, here are just some uh, possibilities of what pure water or SoCal could look like. The treatment plan itself, um, we haven't, we have, we'll have some sketches that we'll bring in to a future meeting, but this is just to get the uh, creative juices flowing. You can really make it look like anything you want. Um, the renditions that we're working on for a future meeting have th features in there, like uh, if you're coming down the bike path, because that's really the only place you can really see the lot, un unfortunately, I guess. Uh, you know, so if you come down, what do you, you know, is there potential for a green roof maybe, or I, I don't know, it's, it's really, we're trying to get, a, get stimulated by the public here. But here's some ideas, next slide. And then, uh, We've done a lot of outreach. We need to do more of the Live Oak. We recognize that. But one thing I would like to point out is that s over 7,500 postcards went out, and a lot of those were in Live Oak. And Santa Cruz. And Santa I mean, Cruz. Our, we have facilities. Yeah. All along the pathway that you saw, there's a certain buffer zone. And then you can see all the other uh, things. We don't need to go into that. Um, so here is an upcoming meeting. Uh, that Live Oak residents particularly are invited to. You can see it's on a, a Saturday and another weekday, so I, I want to encourage people to come to that. We will have uh, our partners, uh, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency will be there, the RTC promoting the, uh, the bike route uh, does pathway. The, does the same 
uh, presentation, same information will be at both meetings. So the one's on a Saturday afternoon and one's on a Tuesday evening. Right, right. And, and um, yeah, try to divide it up to get as many evening. people. Sorry. There'll be, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there'll be interpreters for, for those who... Uh, Spanish. In Spanish. Uh, and some of the, uh, some of the stuff w will be in Spanish, too. So I really want to encourage that. So I think, did we throw this slide in? It's just in there in case. Okay. Well, we wanted to just note that, you know, one of the things related to that area specifically is that we have had people go, you know, there's so much traffic in there, and then you're going to be putting in this, um, your Pure Water Soak Health project there. Just in terms of the impacts that were identified in the EIR, we did want people to note that a facility such as ours really doesn't have a lot of traffic impacts. Uh, the generation of vehicle trips that would go back and forth really are isolated to those who are working at the facility. So we do assume that we probably will have somewhere around f five to ten type five to ten employees that may be coming through there. Um, and it would also be what we have identified is that we do want to encourage education and youth tours. We do have a very broad outreach program and uh, we do consider you know water purification to be something that we want to educate the community on and it was something when we started to do some early outreach with the live oak people they wanted to make sure that we were um, having education there so let me wrap it up with why Chanticleer again so number one live oak is, is we, we as a community and throughout you know have skin in the game so to speak number two the centrally located location of the facility offers up in the future if, if Santa Cruz wants to irrigate with that water along the way, that is a beneficial uh, a use that they could, they could look at if they want to do another, they have to do an EIR, it's not included in our thing, but that's where the bulk of the uh, irrigation for like fields, because remember it's tertiary treated to that level. You, if you purify it down there, if you were, it's, it, it's much more costly and takes more energy, so it's, I don't think, the right environmental thing to do. But if you bring it up to Chanticleer, it could offer going up to uh, De La Viega, there's Simpkins, there's other places. In the future, if Santa Cruz wants to pursue that, the, the, we're building it in such a manner that allows for that. Uh, we, we then, from there on, purifying it, there's very little opportunity for irrigation along the way but you could use that water then if Santa Cruz liked, and again, they'd have to go back to the table, but it would at least be purified. Uh, maybe a recharge pond there at the corner of 38th and Bromer, I think. Um, that's, I've never seen that whole much water would be an example. Um, uh, so that'd be one thing, or other places if, if they need be. So it's designed, the facility's being designed uh, for future potential to benefit even greater than what it's doing now. Uh, and of course, we mentioned that there's a pending legislation about mandating coastal communities reducing their discharge to the bay. So if we that comes to fruition and we don't uh, do that, we're all going to be hit with that. Anybody, uh, if we're not recycling the water. So there's other benefits. I, I'll just touch on one. Right now, I've had uh, like uh, you know, uh, representatives in the community uh, say you're putting a lot of heat on Live Oak and, and other areas because uh, buildings harder in Soquel Creek Water District. Since 2003, we've had what's called our Water Demand Offset Program, and builders, and we're meticulous about this. We, we document it, we, it's all online. You can see they have to save twice the amount of water they're projected to use. So if you build a house, you've got to save twice what it's going to use. And we've seen that in our, uh, in our numbers come down. And what's it cost a single family right now? They can actually buy into that because of, we have a project that'll save some water. But $23,000. So it's about $23,000 extra burden to people developing in Soquel Creek Water District since 2003 to build a, a house because we're in critically overdrafted situation. And we feel, our board has felt that if we didn't, uh, make that mandatory to the developers. Number one, it would do more harm to the basin, but what, what kind of signal would that extend to our existing customers who are saving beyond belief? I mean, we're using about one-third, 50 gallons a day, one-third the av state average. So our people are, are rock stars at saving water, but 
you know, we hear it all the time. I, I want to take a longer shower. I want to quit hauling buckets, blah, blah, blah. So this project will also, uh, if the board uh, chooses, when it comes online, it might uh, have the potential to uh, make that uh, uh, program uh, not exist. Uh, that'll be a board decision, of course. But again, and allow some more development into the how into our area that maybe we're burdening other areas with right now. So I think that's it. Do um, you want to go into the agenda item now that we've set? Yeah. So we set the stage, and I know the public. Uh, you want to get up there and comment, and the board wants to hear that. But what is uh, what really this item centers around tonight is on the back table, as as was mentioned when we went into closed session. Before we went into closed session, we set this out here for the public, and uh, it's it's the uh, agreement for the purchase option. And if the board does approve the purchase option and decide to move forward at a later date with the purchase of the property, it has that agreement too out there. They're on the back table right there. I think there's still copies. Taj or Leslie can. Yep. Oh, okay, so they're there. And so what's in front of the board tonight is uh, to, to direct authorized staff uh, representative um, to sign the agreement for the. Uh, right to uh, the uh, to the option to purchase a property. I want to be very clear: not to purchase a property. And as it's shown in number two here, the motion, if they do go forward with the authorization and sign the purchase option, then the uh, direct staff to come back at a future date, another board meeting. We don't know when that would be, but uh, for approval. And consideration and potential approval of the purchase agreement. So I just want to be very, very, very clear about that. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. Any public comment on this item? Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I hope some of the people that I think are here tonight from the Live Oak um, community will speak. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just want to point out that there is litigation against you, and part of the one of the causes of action is that you did not expand outreach to the Live Oak area when you changed the scope of the project. Those people have had no input on the CEQA process. Yes, they can come and tell you what they want to see now, but they have had no input through the CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act process. That needs to be redone. And so I'm, I'm glad you're doing some outreach now, but doing outreach after the fact does not correct the problem. So again, I'm asking you to respect the litigation that is before you in case 19CV00181 and, and uh, stop with the process of acquiring this pro property. Um, I see that you're now up to over $3 million. That does not, uh, I do not see in here what the premium is, which as I understand, there must be a, a sum of money put forth uh, as consideration to make the contract legally binding. I do not see that in here. And I do see that the term of the um, agreement is one year. I had heard, heard earlier today it was 11 months, so I'm a little confused. Um, you've presented a lot of information. I'm, I, what I have not heard you say is that you're taking this property under uh, friendly condemnation. What is that process? What is it costing? I see that you're going to pay for the survey and um, uh, due diligence. I'm glad you're going to do that, especially when uh, Director Lather had many reservations about this site due to historic use earlier. Um, I want to point out with limited time here that um, you talked about how once seawater comes in, the things are just gone forever. That's not true, and that was pointed out recently when um, it was discussed the Moran Lake uh, monitoring well had been up to 500 to 700 milligrams per liter of chloride. Now it's down to 50, and it, and it is usable. So it can be recovered. I want to encourage people to go to the April 1st, 2019 Santa Cruz City Joint Meeting 
of um, the Water Supply Committee and Water uh, Advisory Committee, wherein Isidro said that actually, would, and Rosemary Menard also, that if Pure Water So Cow comes in along with the very aggressive uh, aquifer storage recharge um, pro project that the city is doing in the Beltswell area, they will actually be competing for storage space. And your own hydrologist has said that if the your two projects go, very much. the water level would come to surface up. level. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope the live vote people will speak. Is there anyone else that wishes to make a comment? Can we reset the clock, please? Thank you. We start off with I do. I thought you were talking. Go ahead. Well, now you just got into my time. <laughs> I'm Marcus Hutnack, and I live in the Live Oak area of Santa Cruz. Um, first time, I'm not a professional uh, person that, that confronts or, or I, I like to live my life, pay my taxes, vote my voters, and bring good people of goodwill into positions of power. And I'm speaking here tonight because that process has now failed. And it's failing the citizens of Live Oak, it's failing the citizens of Soquel, and it's failing the citizens of Santa Cruz County. And I'm here before, because it's really important as a community that we confront the financial malfeasance and community disenfranchisement directly and not let it go unchallenged. The Soquel Creek Water District Board has spent $2 million to acquire a property in Soquel for uses, including a small advanced water purification facility. That money has been spent. And the residents of Soquel, they rightfully complained about the untreated wastewater that was going to be treated in that facility. But this board is, is elected by the citizens of the Soquel Water District and bowing to voter pressure the board found reason to look for an alternative site and found a location in Live Oak for their project. And the residents of Live Oak have no say in that. John Leopold doesn't have any say. We don't have any say in the composition of this board. And that, by definition, is disenfranchisement. And it's not right and it's not just. It gets worse. Now you're looking to spend $3 million, $4 million to buy additional land for a project that you've already bought. This makes no sense. Makes absolutely no sense. The pure water, so Cal water is treated and entirely different now than the original project that was proposed for the SoCal site and that the SoCal re residents uh, oppose. It's an entirely different project. That project needs to go back to the land that you bought you don't spend the $4 million. And just <clears throat> to finish, I would urge the board to locate the Pure Water SoCal project to the original SoCal site and save the ratepayers and taxpayers the millions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Anyone else that wishes to address the board? Uh, my name is Jennifer Campanolo. I am a resident of Live Oak. I have three children um, that I'm raising within that community. Um, I actually do a lot of community support within um, the entire county, um, which I'm really proud of. But what I would really like to understand and um, express my concerns for is that this property at 205 Chanticleer is actually zoned as mixed-use commercial and it's actually located right down the street from a very new, very exciting project, Santa Cruz's first and only handicapped playground. So this is strictly a neighborhood that is up and coming and really trying to move towards a, a family-friendly um, type of a community. And zoning is there in place for a reason, and that's why it's a mixed zoning. Um, and I, I'm just not understanding why the one of the original 
options of research drive is not being taken into consideration when that is more zoned for more industrial and it's not a mixed zoning. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address this? The board. Hi, my name is Julie and I live in Live Oak and I just want to say that I didn't ever receive any information about this going in. I found out about it on the internet and I've talked to neighbors up and down my street and nobody is aware of this going on. And I think it would be very professional and conscientious to the people in the area to let them know so that they can have some input on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Jane. Hi, my name is Jane Paradise and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and um, others in my Soquel Village neighborhood community, which is surrounded, um, which is surrounds the West Annex site on all four sides, um, includes sharing fences. And we do support the district's well research recommendation that the Pure Water Soquel's industrial wastewater recycling project, even as it, as it stands, be appropriately located at industrial zoned locations such as Chanticleer site and Santa Cruz wastewater site. Your decision to choose industrially zoned sites is environmentally sound and consistent with the Santa Cruz County general plan policies and zoning code provisions. We therefore support the board moving forward on the purchase sale agreement for the Chanticleer site location that's before the board tonight. Both Chanticleer and Santa Cruz wastewater facility sites are already zoned industrial and have been for decades. People who work and live there already do so with the full understanding and acceptance of its industrial use location. However, locating this industrial project at West Annex would not be in compliance with zoning, general plan, Soquel Village plan, or the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Placing this industrial facility at West Annex would be in violation of its zoning, which is residential, general plan designation, which is low density residential, as well as the Soquel Village plan where it's designated residential. Decades ago, the Soquel Village community was committed to having a livable village community and they deliberately downgraded all of their zoning. So something that was heavy commercial, they made light commercial. Something that was light commercial, they made residential. And those West Annex sites are on that map and are designated as residential. Additionally, when the co project cost comparisons were made in 2017, the Chanticleer site is 1,700,000 cheaper than the West Annex site. And this is a significant difference in cost, especially for us, the d district rate payers. And these comparisons do already include land cost acquisitions, and even though values both have gone up, those, that still the difference remains the same. So Chanticleer site is 1.9 acres, West Annex is 1.5, which means Chanticleer, the district would be getting more land for significantly less cost to the rate payers. Therefore, we do support the board in finalizing and approving and moving forward on the purchase agreement for the Chanticleer site location. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board? Good evening. My name is uh, Kurt. I am a Live Oak resident, and I attended the prior um, um, board meeting. I think the last time the um, the agenda item was discussed, um, I did talk to you, Ron. I think afterwards, and you did take our name down. And I'd just like to echo the same concerns that some of the other Live Oak residents have expressed, including um, the lack of outreach. Um, you mentioned um, postcards; never received it. You had our name, my phone number, my email, never heard from you. Um, so I, 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 I still clearly have concerns with, with the lack of outreach to the Live Oak community. But I think more importantly, I have bigger concerns with the, with the intended use of the property on Chanticleer. I fully support your project. I think it's a great idea and a great opportunity to further advance, take treated water, 
inject it and and combat that saltwater intrusion but what i don't agree with is where it's being proposed in the community in an area that's really outside of your jurisdiction on a piece of property that is in my opinion prime real estate between 41st and soquel along the frontage road when you have a big anchor development coming in like kaiser that would support other um, um, better uses that would benefit the community uh, the county the live oak community and um, I hear you about the bike path, um, but I think developers can get creative. And, and frankly, I don't think that that's uh, um, an issue in terms of having uh, missing that frontage strip um, with, with uh, an important development like what was being proposed down the street. Um, there would be other opportunities to take advantage of that property for a better use for the community. So that's what I'd like to, um, I wanted to express my concerns. I will be at the meetings later in the month, along with other members of the community, and I look forward to um, hearing more from the district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, um, back to the board then. President you. There, there's a couple of items that were mentioned that are simply not true. There was a statement made that there's no consideration for the option the first five months of the option are covered by the cost of a survey, which if the option is an exercise, is, is something that's of value to the property owner. <clears throat> and the next seven months, which originally were six and it was recently changed to seven in negotiations, which is the difference between the 11 and the 12, as Steinbrenner referred to, that next 12 months, seven months, is paid for at $5,000 a month. So there is consideration for the option. Okay. And the argument that keeps being made that because somebody files a lawsuit on whatever grounds, everybody else must stop is something that Ms. Seinbrenner has put to the court three times in the last four months. And each time the court has told her no and denied her temporary restraining order. That's not the way law works. You have to win your lawsuits and you have to prove to the court that you have an ability to win. You can't just file it and have everybody else stop their activities. Okay, hey, no, All right. public comment period's over. All right, um, any comments or proposals or motions from the board? I still think it's a good place to put it. So yep. I will make the motion. Well, I'm, s I'm still pretty torn about all of this. I I have issues with a lot of misguided people spreading misinformation about the project and using it to win whatever argument is going on and it started with our local people and it seems like it keeps spreading and there's this is a great project it is no matter where it is it's going to be a showcase project and whatever community gets it is going to be lucky in my in my mind i am just disappointed that we're not doing it in socal yeah i'd like to say yeah you know, i've i lived in live oak too i live in capitola now but i have lived in live oak and when i first moved to this area that lot was pretty much <coughs> the way it was nothing had gone on there for over 30 years it's been it's been stagnating uh, suddenly, it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting neighborhood. It's a very lovely neighborhood. But in general, I took my kids to daycare on Chanticleer Avenue. I've been there. I was every there every day of the week for five, ten years. So over that period of time, I got to know the neighborhood a little bit and had friends there. And I respect your community. I apologize that we just because the way this this project developed it's it became much more feasible to put the project in live oak for a number of reasons and not merely the reasons that have been put out there but i have looked at a number of projects up and down the coast recycled water projects and they have the potential to be really an asset to any anyone's community we just looked at one this past march and there's garden either community gardens a place for environmental uh, environmental meetings, for a playground, for gardens. It could be a showcase area. And it would be one that would be accessible by bicycle from all parts of 
you know, many parts of central Santa Cruz, it's really, it can be a very good site. And I think that's, that is one reason why I support it. I think it has great potential as a water project to solve a lot of the problems in the entire basin, which includes Santa Cruz City, Pleasure Point, Live Oak, as well as Aptos, La Silva Beach, and Soquel, and, Apto and Capitola. So it really could be a linchpin for a regional solution to our water, <coughs> water problems in this area. And so I support this project. And I'll, I'll just add that um, it's been pretty clear from the recent groundwater modeling that the best solution for our region is to have both this project and the Santa Cruz you know, the, their, their advanced water, or their whatever, water. the aquifer storage and recovery um, to give us the best chance of preventing groundwater, seawater intrusion. And, and I think it's a real threat, and it's been one of the goals for my time on the board is to try and find a solution so that I, my family can, you know, feel like we have a safe water supply. So I will second your motion, which I'm hoping includes both, both so, motions. Sure, both. Okay. This is and. Yeah. Okay. In fact, to, to say a little bit more about what you said, the modeling has shown that the city's plan, aquifer storage and retrieval, without pure water, fails. Right. So the basin becomes polluted and the state board comes in and takes over. Right. So, all right, let's call for the question then. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Mm, one, me. Okay. The motion passes three to one. Thank you. Um, that concludes our meeting except for written communication. Does anyone wish to make comment on written communication? Yes, I do. Thank you. And I have requested written response from the district and hope that I receive it. Um, many of my comments that I asked for written comment uh, response received none. So um, I, I did write you with these, these concerns, namely the, um, the information that I saw at the county building regarding the Lamb Estate, and uh, no one answered my question about the friendly condemnation proceedings that you are taking to get this land. In 2017, Mr. Duncan had actually sent a letter to Mr. Lamb before he died uh, essentially threatening eminent domain. So this is um, this is an interesting development, and um, I'm disappointed to see that you are forging forward again with this, and uh, that I with a project that I really see as unnecessary with regional management. So um, I would like a response to my first question about the uh, acquisition of the Lamb property what is involved in um, the eminent domain friendly condemnation. The second part of my letter, I ask for um, a, a discussion from you about the placement of your Twin Lakes Church recharge well. Um, in your presentation, you say there's no opportunity for uh, irrigation, yet you have promised Twin Lakes Church three and a half acre feet a year for 50 years, whether the pure water goes in or not. So there is uh, opportunity for irrigation with this treated water. You could do well to irrigate Cabrillo College athletic fields. And in fact, Cabrillo College in a Public Records Act request now says that you are no longer talking with them about any recharge wells. Um, that could have been a golden opportunity to provide them with water for their fields and rest their three private wells that are um, struggling, but you didn't choose to do that. I um, also wanna, in my correspondence, I talk with you about the um, Haley and Aldrich <coughs> hydrologic consultant and the placement of this recharge well in relation to the location of your um, estate's well and how that might be affected. Um, the hydrologist, Mr. Inarson, went to great lengths to discuss, as he said, a bit curious placement of your recharge wells and compared them to what Orange County has done. And your iron curtain against seawater intrusion is not in the proper place to accomplish that. 
And that is not in keeping with what you tout as what Southern California does. So I would like written Thank response. Thank you. Your time is up. I would like written response, please. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank President. you. The meeting is adjourned. We will be back on May 21st.